Hello everybody, this is B. We are back again with Five Nights at Freddy's The Twisted Ones. We only have a little bit more to go. We got two more chapters. And then I don't know what I'm going to read for you guys later. Uh, I don't have the third book. And I honestly don't know what's allowed for me to read. I don't even know if this is technically allowed, but I'm just going to see if it is. I mean, if they copy strike me, then I, I'll take the videos down. So I hope you guys get to listen to these while you can. Because, like, if you're interested in Five Nights at Freddy's, this is a lot to read. So, and my bestie was wanting me to read it anyway, so they know more about the lore. So, we're getting through the lore. I'm learning. You guys are learning. But I don't know how long it'll stay up. And I also don't know what I'm going to do once I run out of books. So... Let's go. Chapter 13. John prodded the plastic balloon boy's head with his toe. It rolled a little farther, but did not speak again. Charlie, Jessica said shakily, where are they? The big ones? I don't know. My head's still spinning, Charlie glanced around quickly, then drew closer to the others as they surveyed the room. Everything had changed when Clay shattered the fixtures. The realistic beasts and vicious-looking creatures were gone, replaced with strange, hairless versions of themselves. They no longer had eyes, only smooth, raised bumps of pl blank plastic. They look like corpse. Corpses, John said softly. Or some kind of mold, Clay said thoughtfully. They don't look finished. It's the lights, Charlie said. They were creating an illusion, like the chip. What are you talking about, Jessica said. What chip? It's some kind of transmitter, and that embedded in the disc, Charlie said. It scrambles your brain, cluttering it with nonsense so that you see what you expect to see. Then why don't they look like that? Clay pointed to posters on the walls depicting a very cheerful Freddy Fazbear with rosy cheeks and a warm smile. Or that, John said, with another, had found another um, depiction of Bonnie. Strumming a bright red guitar so shiny it looked like it was made from candy. Charlie looked thoughtful for a moment because we didn't come here first. She walked around. She walked towards the posters. If you were a little kid and you saw the cute commercials, then saw these posters and toys and all that stuff, then I think that's exactly what they would have looked like because you already had those images in your head, John said. He tore the Freddy poster off the wall and Start, stared at it momentarily before letting it fall to the ground. But we know better. We know they're monsters. And we're afraid of them, Charlie said. And so we're seeing them for exactly what they are, John concluded. Clay went up to the arcade mascot mascots again, his gun still drawn. He walked back and forth in front of the displays, looking at them from different angles. How did you find me, Charlie asked suddenly. You showed up like a, like the Calvary, just in time. How did you know I was here? How did you know any of this was here? No one answered right away. John and Jessica looked to Clay, who was casting his eyes around the room purposefully. He looked like he was searching for something specific. We followed. He trailed off. Charlie looked at each, each of the three of them in turn. Who? she demanded. But just as she spoke, the closet door burst open, banging against the wall with a ringing clatter. The twisted Freddy who had taken Charlie came crashing out, his mouth still unhinged and swinging unnaturally. He was a nightmarish version of Freddy, and they known the Freddy they'd known as uh, as kids with searing red eyes and the um, musculature of a monster. He turned his elongated head from side to side wildly, his jaw bouncing in place. Run, Clay yelled, waving his arms and trying to usher them together towards the door. Charlie was rooted to the ground, unable to take her eyes off the maw of the beast. Wait, Jessica cried suddenly. Clay, these aren't possessed like the others. They're not the lost children. What? He said momentarily, stopping his frantic movement and looking thoroughly confused. Shoot it, Jessica screamed. Clay clenched his jaw, then raised the gun and aimed at Freddy's gaping mouth. He fired once. The shot was only a few feet from Charlie's ear, and it was deafening. 
Freddy jerked back, the python-like jaw contracting, and for a split second his image blurred and distorted. The unnaturally stretched mouth began to close, but before it could, Clay fired again. Three more times in quick sessions. With each shot, the creature seemed to glitch. It blurred, sputtering around the edges. Freddy's mouth curled in on itself, not quite closing, but shrinking inward as the bear hunched forward around its wounds. Clay fired one last time, aiming for Freddy's head. Finally, the animatronic toppled forward, a mishap in heap on the ground. Freddy's image flickered like static on a TV on a television screen. The color faded from his fur. Then everything that made him Freddy winked out, leaving only a smooth plastic figure in his place. It looked like the rest of the animals in the room. A blank mannequin stripped of its characteristics. Charlie approached the thing that had been Freddy cautiously. The ring in her ears was beginning to fade. She crouched down next to the creature, tilting her head to the side. It's not like the other mascots from Freddy, she said. These aren't made of fur and fabric. They're made of us. By twisting our minds. The words came out with a revulsion and she hadn't expected it. Charlie, John said softly. He stepped forward, but she ignored him. She touched the creature's smooth skin. It felt like something between plastic and human skin. A strange, malleable substance that was a little too soft. A little too slick. The feeling of it made her nauseous. Charlie leaned over the body, ignoring her disgust, and plunged her fingers into one of the bullet holes. She dug around in the slippery, inorganic stuff of the chest cavity, pretending not to hear Jessica and Clay's protest. Then she found it. Her fingers touched the disc, which was bent in half, almost broken. Charlie pried out a second piece of the metal that was wedged beside it. She stood up and held it to the others. A bullet rested in her palm. You shot the chip, she said. You killed the illusion. No one spoke. In that momentary quiet, Charlie was suddenly aware of the racket that had just made. And this place so accustomed to stillness. The silence was broken by a clanking sound. The noise of claws on tile. They all were old to see, and from what had appeared to be a dark, empty corner, a wolf-like figure split away from the shadows and stalked towards them, upright but hunched forward, as if uncertain whether to walk as a beast or a human. They backed away as one. Charlie saw Clay about to trip on Freddy's corpse, corpse co on Freddy's collapsed body. She shouted, look out! He stopped, turning to see, his eyes widened at something behind Charlie. There, he cried, and fired a shot into the dark. They turned. A eight-foot mishappened Bonnie, the rabbit counterpart to the creature on the floor, was blocking the doorway behind them. Its head was too large for its body, the eyes glowing white, hot, in the dark. Its mouth was open, revealing several rows of gleaming teeth. Clay fired again, but the bullet had no effect. How many bullets do you have left, John said, measuring up the two threats still in the room. Clay fired off three more shots at Bonnie, then lowered the gun. Three, he said dryly. I had three. From the corner of her eyes, Charlie saw John and Jessica draw closer together, moving a little behind Clay. She stayed where she was The others retreat, as the others retreated, transfixed by the two advancing figures, the wolf and the rabbit. She started to walk towards them. Charlie, John said with a warning tone. What are you doing? Come back. Why did you bring me here, Charlie asked, looking from one creature to the other. Her chest was tight and her eyes ached, like she'd been holding back tears for hours. What do you want from me, she shouted. They looked back at her with impeccable plastic eyes. What is this place? What do you know about my brother, she screamed, her throat raw. She flung herself at the wolf, hurtling towards the gigantic beast as if she could tear it apart with her bare hands. Someone caught her by the waist. Human's hand, human hands lifted her up and pulled her back, and Clay spoke quietly in her ear. Charlie, we need to go now. She pulled herself out of his grasp but remained where she was. Her breath was unsteady. She wanted to scream until her lungs gave out. She wanted to close her eyes and sit very still and never emerge from the darkness. Instead, she looked back. She looked again for Bonnie to the nameless wolf and asked, her voice so calm it chilled her to hear it, Why do you want me? They don't care about you. I'm the one that brought you here, a voice spoke from the sh same shadowed corner. The wolf had emerged. 
The rabbit and the wolf straightened their posture as if responding to the speaker's command. I know that voice, Jessica whispered. A figure began to limp forward, obscured by darkness. No one moved. Charlie realized she was holding her breath, but she didn't hear anyone else breathing in the silence, either just the uneven shuffle or whatever was coming. Whatever it was, it was the size of a man. Its body was contorted, slopping to one side as it lurched towards the group. You have something that belongs to me, said the voice, and then the figure stepped out into the light. Charlie gasped and heard John sharp and take a breath. Impossible, Charlie whispered. She felt John move up to stand beside her, but he didn't dare take her eyes off the man who stood before them. His face was dark, the color molted, and it was swollen with fluid. Cheeks that had been hollow were now distended with the bloat of decay. His eyes were bloodshot. The burst capillaries threading through the eyeballs that looked just a little too translucent. Something inside them had gone bad, jelly-like. At the base of his neck, Charlie could see two pieces of metal gleaming. They extended from within his neck, re rectangular lumps standing out from the, his molted skin. He wore what had once been a mascot suit of yellow fur, though what remained was now green with mold. Dave? Jessica breathed. Don't call me that, he snarled. I haven't been Dave for a long time. He held out his new hands, blood soaked and forever sealed inside a running suit. William Afton, then? Of Afton Robotics? Wrong again. He <gasps> Ooh, almost dropped my book. Wrong again, he hissed. I've accepted the new life that you gave me. You made me one with my creation. My name is Springtrap. The man who had once been Dave cried the name with a hoarse glee, then scrunched his gnarled face back into a glare. I'm more than Afton ever was, and far more than Henry. Well, you smell terrible, Jessica quipped. Ever since Charlie remade me, set me free to my destiny, I've been master of all these creatures. He crooked his fingers and made a sharp gesture forward. Bonnie and the wolf took two steps forward in unison. See? All the animatronics are linked together. It was a system designed to control the choreography for the shows. Choreography. Choreography. I can't speak. Now I control the system. I control it. All of this belongs to me. Springtrap shuffled forward and Charlie shrank back. I owe you both another debt of gratitude as well, he said. I was imprisoned in that tomb beneath the stage, scarcely able to move, only able to see through the eyes of my creatures. He gestured at the two who stood behind him. But for all that I could see, I was trapped. Eventually, they would have broken me out. But having you do it yourself was a delightful surprise. He met Charlie's eyes and a muscle twitched in her neck. Get away from me. Don't come any closer. As if reading her thoughts, he settled nearer to her. He would have... She would have felt his breath on her face if he still breathed. Springtrap raised a bent hand. The fabric suit was ragged, revealing his human skin through the gaps. She could see the places where metal pins and rods had buried themselves alongside his bones and tendons. Into a rusted shadow skeleton. He touched the back of his hand to Charlie's face, stroking her cheek like a beloved child. From the corner of her eye, she saw John start forward. Now it's okay, she forced herself to say. I won't hurt your friends, but I need something from you. You had to be kidding, she said, her voice brutal. His mouth twisted into something that grotesquely resembled a smile. John heard a faint click and turned just in time to see Clay holding one bullet quietly and loading one bullet into his gun. Clay shrugged. You never know when a corpse may wander out of the shadows wearing a rabbit suit. He raised his arm, steadying steadied himself and fired spring trap recoiled kids clay shouted the door charlie jerked her eyes away from spring trap almost painfully as if he had been exerting some hypnotic force on her bonnie had abandoned the exit leaving it clear clay john and jessica began to run charlie glanced back reluctantly to go then joined the others they ran back the way they'd come Clay leading the way as they wound through the carnival games and looming featureless mascots. He strode purposely ahead as if he knew the way. 
Charlie remembered a question that no one had answered. How did you find me? They were chased by sound, scraping metal, and the clack of the wolf's claws. In open space, the noises echoed strangely, seeming to come from every side. It was as if an army pursued them. Charlie quickened her step. She glanced up at John, seeking reassurance, but his eyes were on Clay ahead of them. They reached the room with the waterfall, and again Clay knew the path. He headed directly for the passage beneath the cliff where the water emerged. They pressed through it one by one. Clay and John were too tall and to walk through without bending over, and Charlie felt a quick pang of relief. The monsters won't fit. Halfway through the passage, Clay paused, standing motionless in an awkward position. He craned his neck, studying something just out of view. Clay, Charlie hissed. I have an idea, he said. Two shadows emerged from the far side of the room. Jessica glanced at the black-lit tunnel beside them, ready to run for it. But Clay shook his head. Instead, he guided the group backwards, none of them taking their eyes off the monster. All that shielded them now was the river that beskeeted, bes acted the room. The animatronics were approaching the water hesitantly. The wolf sniffed at it and shook his fur, and Bonnie simply bent down and stared. Don't run, Clay said sternly. They can't cross that thing, right? Charlie said. As if responding to her cue, the two mascots stepped unsteadily into the river. Jessica gasped, and Charlie took an involuntary step back. Slowly and deliberately, the animatronics continued towards them through the waist-high water. The wolf slipped on the smooth bottom and fell. It dumped completely under the water for a moment before scrambling to the side, thrashing violently. Bonnie lost his footing as well, but managed to grab the riverbank and steady himself, then continue forward. That's not possible, Charlie said. Behind her came a peal of laughter and she rolled around. It was Springtrap, his eyes scarcely visible, peering through the blacklit tunnel nearby. Was that your plan, he said, incredulously? Did you think my robots would be as poorly designed as your father's? Well, then, I'm sure you made them fireproof as well, Clay called out. His voice reverberated in the cavernous empty room. Springtrap frowned and puzzled, frowned, puzzled, then looked at the water in the stream. It was glistening in the dim light, color dancing on its surface in the gleaming swirls like gasoline. Charlie turned to face Springtrap. Open gas cans lined the walls, some lying on their sides, all were empty. Clay flicked a lighter and flung it into the water. The top of the river caught fire, a flame billowing up like a tidal wave, scaring the animatronics in the middle. The creature struggled to the side of the river, em emitting guttural, high-pitched shrieks. They managed to crawl onto the bank, but it was too late. Their illusions deactivated. Their plastic skin was exposed, liquefying and falling from their bodies into little flaming pools on the floor. Charlie and others watched as the dissolving creatures fell, writhing in agonized screams. They all stood frozen, mesmerized by the gruesome spectacle. Spectac spectacular? Then from behind her, Charlie heard a quiet scraping sound. She whirled around to see a uh, spring trap vanish into the mouth of the narrow Black Lint Cave, she stood, She took off after him running into the eerie light. Charlie, Clay called. He began to chase her, but the flaming creatures had crawled across the floor, perhaps trying to reach their master, perhaps in a mindless desperation, and now they blocked the mouth of the cave with their blazing remains. Charlie set her eyes on the path ahead. She couldn't afford to look back. The passage was narrow, and it smelled damp and ancient. The floor felt like rock beneath her bare feet. But thought it was uneven. But though it was uneven, it wasn't painful. The surface was worn and smooth. As soon as the dark of the cave closed over her, she felt a spark from her dreams. The tug of something so like her that it was her. Blood called blood calling to blood. Sammy, she whispered. His name glanced off the cave walls, shrouding her in the sound of it. The absence inside her pulled her forward, drawing her towards the promise of completion. It has to be you. Charlie ran faster, following a call that came from deep inside her. She could hear the distant echo of spring traps laughter at intervals, but she couldn't spot him ahead of her. Occasionally, she thought she caught glimpses of him, but he was always gone before her eyes had time to focus in the disorienting glow of the blacklight. 
The king twisted and turned until she had no idea which direction she was headed, but she ran on. Charlie blinked as something moved at the corner of her eye, just out of sight. She took her head and ran on, but then it happened again. She shook her head. An unnatural shape, neon bright, slithered out of the walls. Wrinkled past her. Charlie stopped, clapping a hand over her mouth so she wouldn't scream. The thing undiluted up the wall. Moving like an eel through it was climbing through it, though it was a climbing rock. When it reached the ceiling it vanished, but she couldn't see a break in the rocks where it might have gone. Just keep going. She started to run again, but suddenly more of them poured out of the seam at the base of the wall. Dozens of wriggling shapes swam, swam and danced, moving along the floor of the cave like it was the like the like it was the floor of the sea. Three of them headed right for Charlie. They rippled over her feet, and she screamed, then realized as they circled her, nibbling curiously at her toes, that she felt nothing. You aren't real, she said. She kicked at them, and her foot passed straight through the empty air. The creatures had vanished. Charlie gritted her teeth and ran onward. Ahead of her, large glowing creatures like dancers made of mist appeared and vanished one after another. They dashed across the passage as if they were running along a path that just happened to intersect with this one. When Charlie was almost close enough to touch them, the one nearest sputtered and faded out. She ran on, listening for the sound of spring traps, manacle giggle, hoping that it was enough to guide her. She turned a corner, then the passage angled sharply the other way. Charlie ran straight into the wall, catching herself with her hands at last second. She spun around, looking for the way forward. The jolt had been enough to distract her. She couldn't tell which way she had come from. Charlie took a deep breath and closed her eyes. She could hear a soft voice in the air. Left. She started running again. A burst of blue light nearly blinded her as a massive shape rose in the darkness. Charlie screamed, flinging herself back against the wall of the cave and throwing her arms up to shield her face. The thing before was a gaping mouth full of teeth, all glowing blue. The enormous maw bore down over her. It's an illusion, Charlie whispered. She ducked and tried to roll away in the narrow space. Her shoulders struck a rock and her arm went numb. Charlie clutched it and instinctually and looked up. Nothing was there. She pressed her back against the wall of the cave, taking deep breaths and feeling slowly re- I was feeling so I returned to her arm. It's another transmitter, she said quietly. Nothing I see here is real. Her voice was then in the rocky passage, but saying the words aloud was enough to make her stand again. She closed her eyes. The connection she felt she had felt was growing stronger as she ran, the sense that she was running towards a missing piece of herself. It was unbearable, stronger than the urge to fight or flee from danger. It was a great it was a it was greater than hunger, deeper than thirst, and it pulled at the core of her being. She could no more turn back than she could choose to stop breathing. She set off again, hurtling farther into the cavern. Far in the distance, spring traps laughter still echoed. Charlie, John called again, but it was hopeless. She was long out of sight, deep into the cave, and what remained of Bonnie and the wolf still burned in front of the opening. We have to go, Clay shouted. We can find another way. Jessica grabbed John's arm and he gave in, following Clay towards the arcade entrance. Just as they reached the door, the twisted Freddy lunged out of the shadows, almost falling to the ground. Jessica screamed and John froze, struck still at the sight of him. His illusion sputtered on and off in pieces, an arm flickered away, exposing the smooth plastic underneath. Then the fur returned, and his torso went blank, revealing the gunshot holes and the ugly, twisty, twisted metal beneath the plastic shell. Worse was the face. Not only was the illusion missing, but the material underneath. From his chin to his forehead, the, half, the left half of Freddy's face had been ripped away, revealing metal plates and gnarled wires. His left eye glowed red amid the exposed machinery, while his right eye was com- completely dark. A noise behind them broke John from his horrified revere. He looked back to see that Bonnie and the wolf had gotten to their feet, still smoldering. 
Their plastic casings had almost entirely melted away, still dribbling slowly off their bodies, but the robotic works beneath seemed intact. They approached steadily, moving into position so that John, Clay, and Jessica were surrounded. Do you have any bullets left? John asked Clay in a low voice. Clay slowly shook his head. He was turning in a cautious circle, shifting his gaze from one animatronic to the next, as if trying to gauge which would make the first strike. Charlie ran steadily on, keeping her eyes on the path. She turned another corner and blinked. Something was glowing blue ahead of her. It's not real, she told herself. She paused for a moment, but the glowing shapes didn't move. She kept going, realizing as she drew closer, the passageway was a widening, opening out finally into a small a globe where the blue glow became clear. The floor was spotted with patches of mushrooms, their caps glowing an intense neon blue under the black light. She slowed her pace, went to the nearest grouping, and bent to touch the mushrooms. She snapped her hand back in surprise when she felt a spongy substance. They're real, sort of, she said. Yes, said the voice behind, beside her ear, and then she was choking. Springtrap grabbed her by the neck, crouching her, crushing her windpipe. Charlie only panicked for a moment before anger returned, giving her clarity. She reached her arm out forward as far as she could, then jammed it back, striking her elbow into his solar plexus with, um, with as much force as she could muster. His hands dropped from her throat, and she leaped free, turning to face him as he clutched his injured gut. Things have changed since you died, Charlie said, surprised by the calm disdain in her voice. For one thing, I've been doing sit-ups. I think this is it, Jessica said quietly, spinning in place as the three monsters approached, leaving no avenue of retreat. John felt his chest clench, his body protesting the idea, but she was right. He put a hand on her shoulder. Maybe we can play dead, he said. I don't think we'll have to play dead, Jessica said resignedly. Backs together, Clay barked, and they backed up into a tiny triangle, each facing one of the creatures. The wolf was crouched, ready to spring. John met its eyes. They were blank. The thing drew back, and John steeled himself. Jessica grabbed his hand, and he clenched hers tightly. The wolf leaped and then fell to the ground, screeching as something knocked it viciously on its face. The figure, invisible in the shadows, grabbed the wolf's feet and yanked it backwards, dragging it away from the human prey as it howled, scrabbling at the floor with its claws. It kicked its hind legs, freeing itself, and began its attack again. Jessica screamed and John shouted with her, then watched breathlessly as the wolf was caught by its feet again. The thing that held it flipped it onto its back and jumped on top of it. The new predator paused for an instant, meeting their eyes with silver glow, and Jessica gasped. Foxy, John breathed. As if spurred on by hearing his name, Foxy plunged his hook into the wolf's chest and began to tear at its exposed machinery. The screeches of metal ripping apart metal around ground at their ears. Foxy continued to dig furiously, burrowing into the wolf as wires and parts fell from the sky. He snapped his jaws in the air, then tore at the wolf's stomach, wrenching out its insides and flinging them aside with brutal efficiency. The wolf was overpowered, its limbs flailing and helplessly before falling heavily to the ground. Behind them came another inhuman scream. John whipped around in time to see the fire-ravaged body on its stomach being dragged steadily into the shadows. Its eyes blinked on and off in a panicked, meaningless pattern. It screamed again as with horrible grinding sound. It was torn to pieces by whatever lurked in the shadows. Pieces of metal and shredded plastic scattered across the floor, scattering out in front of the prone rabbit so that it could see the remnants of its own lower half. It screamed again, anchoring its claws into the tall, and the last futile defense only to be pulled screeching into the dark as though, though through a grinder. In the shadows, four lights glowed. John blinked, realizing they were eyes. He nudged Jessica. I can see them, he whispered. Chica and Bonnie. Our Chica and Bonnie. Beside the river, Foxy had torn the wolf's lens from its body. He leaked from the ravaged torso and took an attack posture towards the large, twisted Freddy, which twitched and flickered for a moment, then lowered its massive head and charged. Foxy leaked hitting the twisted Freddy's face with full force and knocked it into the back, then tearing into its head cavity, slashing at what was left of the twisted face with enthusiasm. 
Something grabbed John and he snapped out of his trance. The twisted bunny grabbed him with an arm exposed metal. But the eyes in the dark rose suddenly behind it. The original Bonnie grabbed the torso of the twisted Bonnie and threw it aside to where Chica waited. She grabbed the mishappened rabbit's head and wrenched it off in a burst of sparks. John shielded his eyes. When the smoke settled, all that remained was a hollow, burnt corpse of an unidentifiable monster. Bonnie and Chica had vanished into the shadows. Charlie ran for her out of the mouth of the passage, but string trap leaked on her with per- paternal speed. He knocked her to the ground and reached again for her neck with his swollen hands. Charlie rolled out of the way and something jabbed her hard in the back. She snatched at it and the mushroom cap came away in her hand. She leaped to her knees as spring track got to his feet, circling her, looking for an opening. She glanced down. A sturdy metal spike had held the mushroom cap in place. She grabbed her hand around the base, blocking it from Springtrap's sight with her body. Charlie looked up at him, meeting his gelatinous eyes, silently daring him to attack. As if on cue, he sprang at her, leaping with his arms thrust out, stretching again towards her throat. At the last moment, Charlie ducked her head and thrust the spike upward with all her might. It stopped with a jolt as it hit his chest, but she drove it in, ignoring his sputtering cries as he tried to uselessly to beat her away. She stood her hands shaking as she shoved the stake in as far as she could. He toppled backward and she knelt swiftly beside him, giving the metal pike another thrust. Tell me why, she hissed. It was the question that consumed her, the thing that kept coming back in her nightmares. Now he said nothing and she rocked the sh- the stake back and forth in his chest. He made a gagging cry of pain. Tell me why you took him. Why did you choose him? Why did you take Sammy? Into the cave, John shouted. We had to get Charlie. They hurried to the opening, but from inside the cave came a strange, overwhelming clatter. They all stepped back as a horde of balloon boys emerged from the cave, shaking back and forth on unsteady feet. Their pointed teeth chattering loudly as they wobbled forward with staring eyes. Not again. I hate these things, Jessica cried. Clay took up a fighting stance, but John could see they would be overwhelmed. There was something different about the children now, something coordinated. Though they shook and wobbled, it it no longer seemed like a sign of weakness. Instead, John thought of warriors rattling their shields, the threat before the battle. We had to get away, he said. Clay... Something shook the earth, pounding even footsteps as shadow loomed above them. John looked up and saw a smiling Freddy Fazbear approaching, his hat at a jaunty angle and his massive limbs swinging. Oh no, he's back, Jessica screeched. No, wait, that's our Freddy, John grabbed Jessica and shielded her with his arms. Freddy lumbered past them and into the crowd of balloon boys. With a single lunge, he smashed both arms into the crowd, creating a deafening shatter of metal and plastic. The air was filled with arms, legs, and broken shrapnels. Freddy got to his feet and grabbed one of the balloon boys, lifting it up like it weighed nothing. He crushed its head with one hand. Freddy tossed the body to the ground and stomped on it, pursuing the others as they ran. They scattered, but Freddy was moving swiftly, and the room resounded with the noise of clacking plastic. Come on, into the cave, Clay yelled over the down, and they ran for a passage. They hurried down the narrow path. Clay at the front, John taking up the rear, glancing behind to make sure they weren't being followed. Suddenly, Clay halted, and Jessica and John nearly ran into him. Crowding up beside him, they saw why he'd stop. The path split. There was no trace of Charlie. There, Jessica said suddenly. There's light. John blinked. It was dim, but he saw it. Somewhere down the passage, there was a blue glow, though it was impossible to tell how far away it was. Come on, he said grimly, pressing past Clay to take the lead. Why did you take Sammy? Charlie cried again. Springtrap wheezed and smiled but did not speak. She grabbed his head with both hands, desperately with fury. She lifted his head and brought it crashing against the rock where it lay. He made another sharp grunt of pain and she did it again. This time, something began to ooze from the back of his head, running thickly down the rock. Why did you do it to him? Charlie demanded. Why did you take him? Why did you choose him? He looked up at her. One of his pupils had swallowed the swallowed the iris of his eye. He smiled vaguely. I didn't choose him. Hands grabbed Charlie's shoulder, dragging her up and away from the semi-conscious spring trap. She shouted and turned back to fight. 
only stopping herself when she saw it was Clay. The other was behind him. She turned back, shaking with rage. I'll kill you, she cried. She lifted Springtrap up by the shoulders and shoved him back against the rock. His head bounced and lolled to the side. What do you mean you didn't choose him? Charlie said, leaning in the close to him, as if she might read the answers in his battered face. You took him from me. Why did you take him? Springtrap's mismatched eyes seemed to focus for a moment, and he even seemed to have difficulty muttering his next words. I didn't take him. I took you, Charlie stared, her fingers going lax, loosening on Springtrap's moldy suit. What? The rage that had filled her to the breaking point drained away all at once. She felt like she lost too much blood and was going into shock. Springtrap didn't try to get away. He just lay there, coughing and sputtering, his eyes once more unfocused, staring into a void Charlie couldn't see. Suddenly, the floor rattled beneath them. The walls rocked inward as the whole cave shook and something mechanical roared on the other side of the wall. The sound of grinding metal filled the air. It's a battle royale out there, Clay shouted. This whole place is coming down. Charlie glanced at him and as soon as her head was turned, she felt spring trap slip from her fingers. She whipped back around just in time to see him roll through an open trap door at the base of the enormous rock a few feet away. Charlie leaped up to follow him, but the floor quaked violently. She lost her footing, nearly falling as half the cave well came tumbling down. She stopped glancing around in confusion. Real rock and dirt cascaded all around them. It's not a fake cave that's collapsing, she shouted to the rest. It's the whole building. Is everyone okay, Charlie? Uh, not Charlie, but Clay shouted. Charlie nodded and saw that John and Jessica were still on their feet. We have to go. Light shone through a crack in the wall ahead. Clay started for it, motioning the others to follow. Charlie hesitated, unable to take her eyes from the last place she'd seen spring trap. John put a hand on her arm. The walls of the fake cavern had almost completely fallen, and now they could see the actual interior of the complex. That way, Clay shouted, pointing to a narrow maintenance hall that seemed to stretch off endlessly into the distance. None of these things would be able to fit through there, Clay and Jessica ran from the entrance to the corridor, but Charlie faltered. Charlie, we can deal with him another day, John shouted over the den, but we need to survive this one first. The ground shook again, and Charlie looked at John looked at Charlie. She nodded, and they ran. Clay led them racing through the tunnel as the sound of the collapse chased them. The air was filled with dust, obscuring the path ahead. Charlie looked back once, but the ruins were lost in the haze. Eventually, the rumble of falling rocks was reduced to distant thunder. The clean, narrow halfway hallways began to fill, removed from the madness behind them. Clay, we have to stop, Jessica cried, holding her side like she was in pain. I see something up ahead. I think we're almost to the end of this. There. The hallway ended in a heavy metal door, partially cracked, and Clay beckoned John to help him open it. It squealed and protested, then gave away at the last, op last opening into a simple room of dark stone. One wall of it had been knocked down, and the room gaped open, the cool air pouring in. John looked at Charlie. We're out. We're okay, he laughed. Don't you see where we are, she whispered. She, slowly, she walked the length of the room, just turned to the four enormous pits in the floor, one of which contained a headless, half-buried robot. John, this is my dad's house. It's the room we found. Come on, Jessica. Clay was helping Jessica through the ga gap into the collapsed wall. He paused and looked back to John. It's okay, John said. We'll be right there, Clay nodded. He helped Jessica through the and moved out of sight. What is this? Charlie put her hands on her stomach. I saw an E sailing over her. What's wrong? John asked. Something flickered all around them, a distorting flash too fast to even tell where it had came from. A thunderous crash echoed from the hall they'd just broken out of. Charlie, I think we should go with Clay. Yeah, I'm coming. Charlie followed John to the gap in the wall as he climbed through it. Okay, come on, John shouted, holding out his hand to her from what had once been her own backyard. She started forward, then stopped as the light flickered again. What is that? It was the walls. The whitewashed concrete was blinking in and out of his existence, shivering like a dying bulb. It was the wall Charlie had been drawn to the first time they came to this place. Now she felt it pull as she had in the cave. It was stronger here than it, w it had been. Even in the drains that left her drained and aching. 
I'm here. She took a step forward the far wall and felt another pang in her stomach. Here. Yes, here. Charlie, John, Charlie, John cried again. Come on. I have to, she said softly. She went to the wall and put her hands on it as she'd done before, but this time the concrete was warm and somehow smooth despite the rough finish. I had to get inside. For a moment, she felt like she was in two places at once, inside the little room and on the other side of the wall. Despite desperate to get through, she drew back suddenly, taking her hands off the wall as if it burned. The illusion flickered, then died together altogether. The concrete wall was made of metal, and at the center was a door. Charlie stared, blank with shock. This is the door. She'd been drawing it without knowing what it was, approximating over and over something she had never seen. She stepped forward again and put her hands on the surface. It was still warm. She pressed her cheek against it. Are you in here? She called softly. I had to get you out. Her heart was pounding, blood rushing in her ears so well that she could scarcely hear anything else. Charlie! Charlie! John and Jessica were both calling for her, calling her from outside, but their voices seemed as distant as a memory. She stood, not taking her hands from the metal, but tracing her fingers along it. It felt like letting go for even an instant would cause her pain. She brought her hands to the crack in the wall. It had no handle, no knob, and no hinges. It was just an outline. And now she ran her thumb up and down the side of it, trying to find a trip. Some trick that would make the door open and let her through. She heard John climb back inside and slowly approach her, keeping his distance as though he, he might scare her away. Charlie, if you don't get out of here, you'll die. Whatever's behind the door, it can't give you back your family. You still have us. Charlie looked at John. Her eyes were wide and frightened. She took a small step towards him. We've lost enough. Please don't make me lose you too, John pleaded. Charlie stared at the ceiling as it trembled. Clouds of smoke were pouring out of the corridor. They'd come from. John coughed heavily. He was choking. She looked at him. He was terrified, unwilling to draw closer than he already was. She turned again. The world around her faded. She can't hear John behind her or smell the smoke filling the air. She laid her hand flat against the wall. A heartbeat. I feel a heartbeat. Though she made no intentional movement, her body turned to the side. She tensed, committing to the remain where she stood. Without ever making the decision, something began to hiss. The steady, gentle sound of air being released. From the base of the door came a rhythmic clicking. Charlie closed her eyes. Charlie, John grabbed her and turned her forcefully towards him, shaking her out of the stupor. Look at me. I'm not leaving you here. I have to stay. No, you have to come with us, he cried. You have to come with me. No, I... Charlie <coughs> Charlie felt her voice trail off. She was losing strength. I love you, John said. Charlie's eyes stopped drifting. She fixed them on him. I'm taking you with me right now. He grabbed her hand roughly. <coughs> Choking. He was strong enough to pull her away by force. She knew, but he was waiting for her to acknowledge him. She looked into his eyes, trying to let them bring her back. It felt like trying to awaken from a dream. John's gaze was an anchor, and he, she held it, letting him keep her steady, draw her back to him. Okay, she said quietly. Okay, John repeated, even the words out in a sigh. He'd been holding his breath. He walked backwards, guiding her as well as he went. She climbed to the top of the broken wall and paused, bracing herself against the instant pull of the door and what lay behind it. She took a deep breath then was torn backwards by the by a colossal force. She ripped back through the rocks, and her arms pinned to her sides. Charlie screamed, struggling to get away. Dimly, she heard John shouting close by. But she whipped her body back and forth against its grip. Charlie glanced the immense thing that had her, caught her. The twisted Freddy stared blankly forward, or at least what remained of it. It held her with one arm. The other was gone, and wires hung from its shoulder like extra bits of sinew. Its plastic casing had melted away, and what remained was metal plates and straight stays. The skeleton was unnatural bulges and gaps in the frame where the collapse had mangled it. Its face was a gaping hole, filled spilling teeth and wires that hung into shapeless masses. Charlie couldn't see its legs, and after a second, she realized they were gone. It had dragged itself one arm through the rubble. Wires spilled out of its body like guts, and when she saw its stomach, Charlie went cold with terror. 
The chest had parted at the middle, sharp, uneven teeth lined both sides. Charlie kicked at the animatronic, but it did no good. It forced her instantly into the chasm. The thing embraced her, pushing her deeper inside its chest as they toppled backward together. The metal rib cage snapped shut. She was caught. Charlie, John was kneeling beside her, and she reached out through the metal plates, the metal strays. He grabbed her hand. Clay, he shouted, Jessica. Jessica was there in seconds. Charlie could see Clay struggling back through the narrow opening. Wait, Charlie cried as Jessica tried to pry the chest open. The spring locks, they'll kill me if you touch the wrong thing. But if we don't get you out, you'll die anyway, Jessica shouted. Charlie saw for the first time that the mouth wasn't finished closing. It was layered somehow, and the metal plates began folding over her like petals of a horrid flower. John started to stand, but Charlie tightened her hand around his. Don't let me go, she cried, panicked. He dropped back to his knees and pulled her hand to his chest. She stared at him, even as the metal plates closed over her, threatening to seal her off. Jessica tried to jam them delicately without setting off the spring locks. John, Charlie gasped. Don't, he said roughly. I've got you. The plates continued to slide down and meet in the center. Charlie's arms, arm was trapped in the corner of the strange mouth, protruding from the only gap where the plates didn't meet. She looked around wildly. Another layer was closing. She was wedged into the suit haphazardly, her whole body crammed into Freddy's torso. She could see nothing but dimming figures as more layers of metal and plastic closed over her. Above her, Jessica was trying to stop the next layer from emerging. She felt Freddy's mutated body lurch. Jessica, look out! She screamed at the top of her lungs. Jessica leaped back just in time to avoid Freddy's violent swinging arm. The animatronic was on its back, but it struck out randomly, beating Jessica and Clay away. Its body rocked back and forth. Charlie's and Charlie eyed the springs and robotic parts all around her. She drew her knees up to her chest, trying to make herself smaller. John let go of her hand, and she grabbed at his absence. She could no longer see outside. John! Freddy's body shook, struck by a massive blow. Let go of her, John screamed. Clay hefted a metal beam from the ground and struck at Freddy's head. The twisted bear tried to strike with its remaining arm. Clay ducked out of the way and hit it again from the other side, out of reach. Jessica was still at the creature's chest, trying to find an opening to pry up, but each layer melded seamlessly together. There was nothing to catch. Uh, John moved, to, moved in next to her, trying to help. Clay struck at the head over and over, making Freddy's whole body jolt with every blow. I can't get to her, Jessica yelled. She's going to suffocate. She tried to steady Charlie's trembling hand. Clay hit Freddy's head one once more with a resounding crash, and they heard metal cracking as the head was knocked off the creature's body. Can we get her out through the neck? John asked urgently. Freddy's arm continued to flail, but it had weakened. It was just rising and falling, seeming to swing without purpose. Clay, help! Jessica cried. He ran to take over, digging his fingers between the plates to pry them open. Jessica continued holding Charlie's hand, which had gone limp. Charlie! Jessica cried. Charlie's hand closed over hers again. Jessica gasped with relief. John, Clay, she's okay. Hurry. Charlie, can you hear me? It's Jessica. There was no sound from inside. Uh, Freddie stilled Jess, but Charlie held on tightly to Jessica's hand as the others grimly worked to free her. Suddenly, a high-pitched click reverberated through the air. John and Clay froze, their hands still hovering above Freddie's chest. For a moment, the air stood still, then the metal body convulsed violently. It launched itself off the ground and ghastly crunched metal pierced the air. All three pulled back instinctively. Clay and John jumped from the thing and Jessica scrambled backwards, dropping Charlie's hand. The suit fell again and it was still. The arm, the arm was splayed on the ground at an awkward angle. The room was silent. Charlie, John said softly. Then his face went white. He ran to a place where her arm was exposed, falling hard on his knees, and grabbed her hand in both of his own. It was limp. John turned it over, tapped her palm with his fingers. Charlie! Charlie! John Jessica said silently, or quietly, the blood. He looked up at her, confused, still holding on to Charlie. Then something wet dripped onto his hand. There was blood running out of the suit and down Charlie's arm. 
Her skin was slick and red, except the hand he held. He watched, unable to look away as it dripped steadily from the suit, pulling on the ground and beginning to seep into his jeans. Covered his, it covered his hand and hers until his skin was slippery and he began to lose his grip. She was sliding away from him. Signs were suddenly nearby and John realized vaguely that he'd been hearing them in the distance. He looked dazedly up at Clay. I, radi I radioed them in, he said. We aren't safe in here. Clay took his eyes off the suit and looked up to study the ceiling. It was bowed and cracking on the verge of collapse. John didn't move. People were shouting outside and flashlights bobbed up and down as they ran towards the crumbling building. Jessica touched his shoulder. Breaks and cracks resounded through the space. John, we have to. As if the marker point, the floor shook again beneath them, and something crashed loudly not far away. Charlie's hand didn't move. A uniform officer pressed through the crack into the wall. Chief Burke? Thompson? We have to get the kids out now. Thompson nodded and motioned to Jessica. Come on, miss. John, come on, Jessica managed to say, and thunderous clatter sounding from behind them. Clay looked to the officer again. Get them out of here. Thompson took hold of Jessica's arm and she tried to shove him away. Don't touch me, she shouted, but the officer firmly pulled her up and over the rubble, half dragging her outside. John only half heard the commotion, then someone's hands were on his shoulders as well. He batted them away, not looking around. We're leaving, Clay said in a low voice. Not without Charlie, John responded. Clay took a deep breath. John saw him signal someone from the corner of his eye, then he, grabbed, he was grabbed forcefully by two large men and dragged towards the opening. No, he shouted. Let me go. They shoved him roughly over the broken wall, and then Clay strickled out behind them. Is everyone out? A female officer called. Yes, Clay said hesitantly, but with the ring of authority. No, John shouted. He broke free of the officers, holding him back, and ran for the opening again. He had one foot through the gap, then stopped dead as a sweeping flashlight briefly illuminated the room in front of him. A dark-haired woman knelt in the pool of blood, holding Charlie's limp hand. She looked up sharply and met his eyes with a piercing black gaze. Before John could move or speak, hands grabbed his shoulders again and drew him back, and then the whole house collapsed before them. And that's the end of chapter 13. So, that was a long one, but it was definitely interesting. The last few chapters have been pretty long. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye!